Well, I hope that you were blessed by uh, the ministry of, uh, uh, of Trevor and Rensha and Amber this morning. What a powerful time of worship. What a powerful time of, of being in the presence of God. Amen. Thank God for His presence. Thank God for His grace this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Um, I know you have to do a switch. You know, after watching the, the worship set now, you've got to come up to watching me live on, on Facebook this morning. Welcome, welcome Shekinah, welcome Shekinah and friends. For those who are, are joining us this morning, those who are with their family, uh, you may not be a member of Shekinah, but you are a member of the body of Christ, praise the Lord. I think uh, in the, this day of, of uh, the church finding itself in uh, the strange environment, uh, it is breaking down the walls of, of denominations. It's breaking down the walls of sectarianism within the church. And uh, we are seeing a greater display of a demonstration of the body of Christ in a new and a special way. I find it really amazing. I find it uh, a wonderful expression of, of God's grace and His love in the earth today that we can take off our, our various denominational jackets, our church jackets, our church branding, and just be the body of Christ. Isn't that a powerful thing? You know that uh, in your home, some of you may be Baptist, some of you may be Anglican, uh, from different denominations. Some of you may be, may be Pentecostal. But that's not the issue. The issue is that we are the body of Christ. That we must throw off our labels. That we must throw off the branding and embrace what God has for the church. Well, we are on an amazing day today. This is the remembering of uh, quite a profound uh, day in the history of the church called Pentecost Sunday. Now, the early church didn't go to Jerusalem to, yes, they celebrated the, the Jewish tradition of Pentecost, but they didn't go to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost like we do. They looked forward. We are looking backward. So, beloved, this morning, I've got one of my favorite t-shirts on again. It's one that I wore um, at our New Year's Eve service where I spoke about that we need to relay God's word, that we need to speak what God is speaking. But this morning, I want to speak about expecting what God is expecting and waiting for what God wants to do in the earth. So, beloved, Pentecost Sunday is a commemoration of what happened more than 2,000 years ago in the life of the body of Christ. When um, uh, the saints, the, the 11 that, that followed Jesus, they then, then chose a 12th person to join them, to fill up the position that, that Judas left. And um, uh, they were obeying the Holy Spirit and, and waited in the upper room. And I'm going to read the text right now, but just giving a little bit of, of background uh, to it. Where we find ourselves, what are we celebrating? What is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday is celebrating the experience of what is known as the outpouring and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I love the Holy Spirit, beloved, because the person of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus said it is more beneficial for you as a church for me to leave and for the Father to send you the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is to the benefit of the church. Now, we as a Pentecostal people sometimes set ourselves apart from the rest of the body of Christ because we have attached ourselves the name Pentecostal. As if, you know, I'm not saying that this is what we are, are portraying, but we need to be careful of what we can potentially portray to the world. That we are the people of the fire of God. Now, beloved I don't believe any church can own the Holy Spirit. How can you own God? How can you own the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit owns us. God owns us. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross to purchase silver and gold. Didn't purchase us. The silver and gold of ecclesiastical institution, the silver and gold of a church didn't purchase us. But the precious blood of Jesus purchased us. And we are owned by God. And when God pours out His Holy Spirit, it is for all of the church. And I will mention that later on. But I'm mentioning that history um, to also share with you that throughout the ages, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, not only the book of Acts, and I'll share some scriptures with you later on. Throughout the book of Acts, there were certain incidents 
uh, in the scriptures where and happenings and events where where the Holy Spirit was poured upon the church, not just in Acts chapter two. And so when we celebrate Pentecost, we can't just celebrate Acts chapter two and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We must also celebrate the various other times where the Holy Spirit divinely by God was poured out on, on generations in times gone by. There was, for example, in, in 1906, a revival in Wales, what is called the Welsh Revival. And um, to such an extent was there a powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit. People got saved. The jails were empty. The policemen and women could no longer do their jobs because there was no crime. The bars were empty. And uh, to occupy themselves, policemen went to go and play the piano in the bars because they had no work. There was such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There was, there was the change of language. People that used to have the custom of swearing, drinking and smoking stopped those habits. Why? Because there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Then in the, in the early 1900s as well, there was an outpouring in Azusa Street where a man called William Seymour was led of the Holy Spirit and, and to pray and brought people together and uh, with his face under a, a, a basket, uh, um, he was seeking God and there was a phenomenal outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I'll mention some, some more. And beloved, in, in, in Indonesia, there, there was a revival. Now, I read a book when I was a young student and it influenced me tremendously. It was called Like a Mighty Wind. And the author's name is Mel Tari. And um, an Indonesian man who gave himself to prayer and experienced phenomenal revivals. I had the opportunity to listen to him personally preach a man filled with the Holy Ghost. And it instilled within me a desire for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit like I've never experienced before. Now, beloved, I must tell you a little bit about my own story. That at the age of 11, when, when I committed my life to Christ, it was in a church called St. Cyprian's in Fifth Avenue Retreat where this Anglican church experienced revival likened to the day of Pentecost, where people that are not known for the moving of the Spirit, not associated with the move of the Spirit, yet experience it because they were a people that fulfilled the criteria that I'm going to share with you today. So, beloved, today we look back to Pentecost. We look back at these various experiences that happened in the life of the church at age 11 when I was filled with the Holy Spirit and as 11 year old spoke in tongues that no teacher, uh, no principal taught me. It came by, uh, via the Holy Spirit. And I long for those days, beloved, and I'll share a little bit more about my experience later on in this message. But this morning, I want to share with you the following. We are looking back to what happened more than 2,000 years ago. So let's read together Acts chapter 1 verse 4 to verse 5 if you, if you would, if you have your Bibles with you. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 and verse 4 to 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of the rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues of fire, each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Beloved, what were they waiting for? They waited for the promise of the Father. How did they wait? They waited with obedience. They waited with joy. They waited with one accord and they waited for prayer. What did they wait for? They, wait, they were waiting for the promise of the Father. That something would be passed on to them. That something would be given to them. Just like the early church waited, beloved, you and I are called to wait. My message is entitled this morning, as I posted it on Facebook last night, Ready, Set, Wait. Now, I wasn't much of an athlete when I was at high school. 
I have a, had a, a, a brother in the class, Colin van Weyck. He's a pastor today, a phenomenal man of God, of compassion, um, working out in the Strand, a phenomenal man. But he was a phenomenal runner, a long-distance runner. Uh, so Afrikaans, he was a kranige atleet. But the thing that, that really amazed me most about athletics, particularly uh, in the days when we, for those of my age, went to Athlon Stadium uh, and the school sat in their various positions, dressed up in our uniform, singing various songs. But the highlight of the day was the relay. The highlight was of the day is when the man had a baton in his hand and he knelt down and the, the starter said, get set or ready, steady, go. And they would pause down, some of them just bare feet, some uh, all fancy with spikes on and with starting blocks. And they would position themselves waiting for the, the sound of the, of the starter's gun to just leap off into speed of power and of energy with a baton in the hand. But on the other side, at the 300 meter line, would be a man waiting for the baton. That was the relay. The man who starts has the one with the energy that has, the, has power, but the other one waits there with, with latent energy, waiting to take the baton and to run. So this morning, as I take off my jacket and share with you, just the name. I know it's a, it's a brand. of, And this is a gift that one of the young men in, in church gave me for my birthday last year. And I love what it means. It means to relay. It means to pass on. It also, like electricity, it, it relays. It pass on energy. The relaying. And there is the Pentecost is about passing on the promise of God, God himself passes on to the church an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that, that Joel prophesied and I'll share it with you later on. And we look back at Pentecost and we receive from them this message of, God, of how powerfully God used them. We read it about it, beloved, in various portions in the scriptures. They waited. Uh, uh, Peter in Acts chapter 2 verse 14 verse 17 says to the saints who, who, are, who are wondering what's happening, believers and unsaved alike are wondering about this outpouring of the Holy Spirit and immediately after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit they find people criticizing uh, what is happening. Some say they are drunk. Peter said they are not drunk but this is that he says. In, in Acts chapter 2 verse 14 to 7, this is that, this is what? This is what Joel, the prophet, prophesied that would happen in the last days. God would pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. I believe even today's age, we should be able to say when the Holy Spirit is moving in our midst, then people are wondering what is happening, that we said we can relate to them. We have received what the early church received, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and we pass it on to you, that this is that which God did in, in, in the day of Pentecost. This is what God did in Wales. This is what God did in Azusa Street. This is what God did at St. Cyprian's at 5th Avenue when, when God poured His Holy Spirit upon a people that were hungry enough for God. This is that, a dramatic and a powerful experience that the church had and that what we as the church should have today. Can somebody say Amen? Listen to what happened in, 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 in the book of Acts. Listen to what it is here. And I, just, and I want to read it to you from my Bible this morning. Because this is powerful. And I'm going to read it again in chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Beloved, when we started off um, in, um, in this lockdown, we were looking at the Lord's Prayer. And we were praying, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Beloved, Pentecost is the will of heaven. Pentecost is the will of the Father. The, the, the disciples were told, you will receive what the Father has promised. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit was promised by the Father. Promised by the Father. The sound of, from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and then they appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and uh, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak um, with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Beloved, what an outpouring of the Holy Spirit! What a phenomenal outpouring of the Holy Spirit that they experienced. 
as I just warm my voice with some hot water this morning because I'm getting excited to preach. I already just sense the presence of God in my study as I relay this message to you. And just like an athlete who, who speeds off, uh, speeds off with energy with, with in, in his muscles and, and power and runs off with that baton. I believe it throughout the ages there are some and as the, the, the athlete waits his hand uh, or is extended to receive he positions himself and readiness to go. So we as a church needs to in this relay of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit from generation to generation. I'm speaking to young people this morning because the, the prophecy of Joel is meant for, for a younger gen. Young men shall see visions and young men and women shall prophesy and old men shall dream dreams and the Holy Spirit shall be poured out on men and on women, male servants and men. Nobody should be excluded and young people in particular. I'm speaking to a millennial generation this morning. I'm speaking to a people that is distracted by social media, a, 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 a people that is distracted by entertainment. We should not be distracted. We should be at a place where we are waiting for the generation who is before us to put a baton in our hands so that we can be running, beloveds. What were they waiting for? This is what Israel expected. This is what the people of God expected would happen in the last days. Peter's generation experienced and witnessed an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that was unprecedented. Everybody is saying that we are living in unprecedented times. But can we get to the place not just in unprecedented times unprecedented times but can we experience the unprecedented never be done before that what Peter experienced in the day of Pentecost and what Azusa experienced is what they experienced and what the Welsh people in the revival experienced and what the people at St. Cyprian's experienced and what Blessed Hope Church in Craddock Road Full Gospel Church where I experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit through my mentor doctor uh, Theo Bowers seeing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with phenomenal gifts of signs and of wonders. We should ex trust God for our own experience in the year 2020, beloved. I'm not looking back as if I want to be there. I want to be in this season now and wanting God to do an outpouring for this generation. What he has planned in advance for us to experience. Wind, earthquake, earthquake-like power, thunder, tongues of fire. Peter genera Peter's generation wasn't the only generation who experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 4 verse 31, the Bible says, when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered uh, together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Every time when God added to the church new believers, each one of them experienced an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. None of them said it happened in chapter 2 and it happened in Paul's days on the day of Pentecostal. Pentecost, we don't have to experience. Beloved, I want to say to you today, don't believe this lie. Don't believe this myth that the Pentecostal experience is only for 2,000 years ago. Don't believe this myth. Don't believe this lie that the outpouring of the Holy Ghost was only meant for Wales or for Azusa Street. No, beloved, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is in this Last days and it should be happening now, praise God. Go read Acts chapter 9, how Saul, who became Paul, uh, was filled with the Holy Spirit to, to become a witness for God. Go read Acts chapter 13 verse 52, as the Bible says, And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Beloved, this is a continual thing. I experienced that 11-year-old boy, but I also experienced as a 20-year-old young man at the University of the Western Cape, where I sensed the drawing of the Holy Spirit and the longing for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I'll share a little bit about it in, in a while. As I experienced the power of of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost is about the power of the Holy Spirit. I already shared with you about the Welsh Revival. I shared with you about the Azusa Street Revival, uh, uh, the Welsh Revival in 1904, the, the Azusa Street Revival in 1906. But in the 1930s, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the nation of Uganda, in the nation of Kenya, in Ta uh, Tanganyika, uh, in Rwanda, Urundi. There was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit when 
a people called the Balokele, the people that were changed, the people that were saved, the people that were chosen. That's what Balokele means. Uh, an African revival happened in Uganda that swept throughout East Africa, an experience of the Holy Ghost. Uh, let us not believe, beloved, that Revival is only an American or a Western thing. Maltari in Indonesia experienced such a powerful revival in his day to such an extent where God caused people, even Indonesia, to walk on water. Yes, they walked on water. They raised the dead. They cleansed the lepers. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit with signs following for those who believe. Believe what? Believe the promise of the Father. Now, beloved as we look at these revivals of past and we receive the baton from them. As I spoke to, to Dr. Bowers uh, during the week and, and we're talking about an outpouring of the Holy Spirit even in homes. Beloved, God wants to do a new thing even in our homes and outpouring that God would put, up, uh, put fires all over the nations in, in, in our houses just like they move from house to house that even in this day right where you are sitting that you can experience the power of the Holy Ghost. Just like the saints waited in the upper room. If you are willing to wait for God during this lockdown, locked in your house, locked in your room, in your room per se in isolation because somebody at work has contracted the virus or somebody at home. I believe even this time as you're trusting God to touch your body that you will trust God for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. These revivals took place, beloved. Pentecost happened, it took place. The various chapters in the book of Acts and how I found myself, beloved, looking at what Jesus did in the ministry of Jesus. I just found myself during this lockdown studying the Gospels of Jesus Christ. I found myself just in my face in the book looking at the, at, at the miracles of Jesus. Just like Luke writes through Theophilus and he tells him about what Jesus has done and what Jesus has spoken by the Holy Spirit. I found myself... In the book of Acts, engrossed by the profound miracles and the, and the accompaniment of angelic attention and angelic power in the preaching of the gospel. Beloved, I believe in even this day, it is our heritage to take the baton and believe God that what happened 2,000 years ago, what happened 100 years ago in Azusa can happen to us. What happened in the 1930s in Uganda, what happened in the life of Andrew Murray uh, in the Dutch Reform Movement experience in Wellington can happen to us today. We should be able to say 30 years from now if Jesus not have returned, our children should, should say in the year 2020 there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the generation before us told us about what God has done and how there is receive the Holy Spirit. And this morning, beloved, I want to share with you four, shortly, four things that the early church did. Four things that the early church did to receive this promise of the Father. Now, believers, as I said, uh, it was Joel's prophecy in Joel chapter 2 verse 28. It was John the Baptist himself who said that Jesus would come and he would baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Pentecost must be about the fire, the fire of purification. Uh, and I'm going to share, uh, speak about it now that the Holy Ghost came upon them, everybody like tongues of fire. It's once again that the Holy Spirit must touch our speech, beloved. The Pentecostal church must once become a people whose tongues like the coal that came from the altar and touch the tongue and the lips of, of Isaiah the prophet. We need to trust God for an out, outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon our tongues that our speech needs to be uh, touched again. That a Pentecostal church once again should start speaking what the Holy Spirit says and not what the flesh as referred to by, by Jesus himself in John chapter 7 verse 37 when he says uh, uh, in John chapter 14 uh, saying that the Holy Spirit would come. It was anticipated when Jesus spoke about it after his resurrection in John chapter 20 verse 22. It was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 verse, 2 verse 4 like I just shared with you. Now beloved, they waited in obedience. The first thing they did, they waited in obedience, last week I spent much time to speak to you about Acts chapter 4, verse 30, 31 and onwards. It said the Holy Spirit was given to those, those who obeyed. Beloved, there is a requirement and God is not going to compromise on His requirements. The requirements is obedience. Now, I know that all of us, I fail. Like a Paul, I would say, I, 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 I'm the least of God's servants. 
I would say that this morning because I'm a man of failure. I'm a man of, of, of that no disappointments. I, I, I'm a man who, who can look back at my ministry and say, God, that is where you pulled me up. That is where I stumbled. Even though a righteous man falls seven times, Lord, you will uphold them. Yes, God, by his grace has kept me from, from serious sin. And I thank God that he will continue to keep me from falling. That I cannot stand in my own self. But beloved, there is a requirement in the Holy Ghost that you and I need to comply with. And it's, an, it's a requirement of obedience. The early church in obedience were, uh, were willing to let God command them. We live in a day and an age where the church don't want to be commanded. We want a convenient gospel. We want a comfortable gospel. But they waited, the Bible says. I can't predict or state emphatically this morning. That we are finding ourselves in the last generation that will experience the power of God. I don't know when Jesus is coming. Jesus himself says only the Father knows the hour and the day when the Son of Man shall return. It can be a hundred years from now. It can be 30 years from now. But in this age, beloved, I believe that we should be a generation that experienced the last day outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But if we want to experience a Pentecost day like experience, a last day outpouring of the Holy Spirit in these days, then we will have to abide and wait like Peter's generation wait. They waited in obedience. We will have to become obedient to the commands of Christ. We should once again obey Matthew 28 verse 18 that we must go and preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. Only a discipleship making church will be a recipient of the Holy Ghost. Hear me today, Shekinah as a Pentecostal church, we need to obey the Lord Jesus Christ and become a disciple making church. A church that does not make disciples is not worthy of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God's not going to waste His anointing. God is not going to waste His Holy Spirit on a disobedient church. God's not going to waste His anointing and His powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit on a disobedient Christian who sits at home, who doesn't read his Bible, who doesn't pray, who doesn't obey the Scriptures, who does not allow align his life with, with the purposes of God in his life. That is what God desires of the church. We need to be a church that waits in obedience. Secondly, beloved, the church waited with joyful expectation. We live in a day and age where the enemy wants to steal our joy, beloved. The enemy wants to steal our joy. He has brought this, this disease upon the world and people are fearful and in fear and anxiety. We lose our joy. We lose the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Luke chapter 24 verse 50 to 53 speaks the following. Let me share it with you this morning. Luke chapter 24. Verse 50 to 53, it says, And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he parted from them and carried, and, and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. You see, beloved, in their obedience, obedience will release joy. As you and I wait in obedience, there's a joy of God that we are expecting God to do. A joyful expectation. If you and I are going to be recipients of an end time outpouring, we will have to wait in the river and the ocean of God's grace. That word joy means the source of grace. A, a source of grace, joy. Joy is, it comes from a place, an inner resources of the joy of God within us, beloved. We need to rely on the grace of God, not on our human carnal potential, on our human carnal ability, on our human, great, on our human uh, uh, talents and human capacity. We need to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. It is not by might, it is not by power, but it's by the Holy Spirit that He will will do in the earth what God from heaven desires to do in the earth today. We do not dance to get joy. We do not sing to get joy. We sing and we dance just like Amber danced, just like Trevor sang, just like Rensha sang. Now they sing from a place of the joy of God that's from the rivers of life that's within us. 
Glory to God. Just like a pregnant woman joyfully expects the birth of the baby and looks for the estimated due date. Beloved, there is an estimated due date for the church that is willing to wait in obedience. That's for the church that is willing to wait with joy. But beyond obedience, beyond joy, beloved, the Bible says they waited with one accord. Beloved, every revival from Pentecost to Paul's day to Peter's experience in Acts and every chapter where there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes to to the Ephesians says, don't be drunk with wine, but be he filled with the Holy Spirit. The Ephesian church, the Galatian church, the church in Thessalonica, the church in Philippi, the church where Titus pastored, the church where, where Timothy pastored, experienced an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The church Shekinah in Beacon Valley, whatever your church name is, you from another church watching this online broadcast as I go live this morning on this message. May you have a desire for the Holy Spirit. But one requirement they had, they not only waited with obedience and with joy, but they waited in one accord. I remember as a child, when there was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and St. Cyprian, there was a joyful unity. People would come together. People would seek the Lord. People would get there early in the morning at St. Cyprian before uh, the, the, the early morning service. I think it was 7.30. There was a 7 o'clock service, but at 4 o'clock in the morning, the saints at... Uh, Fifth Avenue retreat would see God, the minister that would wear his, his religious regalia, would be early in the morning on his face, on his pulpit, seeking the face of God for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There is a one accord that they came together waiting on the Lord, waiting on an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, we've got to be in one accord. Holy Spirit is only going to come when we are in one accord. Unity is God's requirement. Psalm 133 verse 1 says, Blessed is a society, the Bible, if I can paraphrase it, where there's unity. God's blessings come upon where there's, when men dwell together in unity. God pours out His blessing. It's like the oil that runs down the beard of Aaron. God wants to touch God's leaders again with His anointing, but it's going to come with unity. But the other, yes, the Holy Spirit comes with unity, but it also goes away with division, beloved. Every revival, the Indonesian revival, the Welsh revival, even the revival in Azusa Street was attacked with division, attacked with, by the devil with a spirit of criticism and, and division. Tongues of, of discord were sown. Words of discord broke the revivals. But beloved, you and I are not going to be recipients of the Holy Spirit as a divided church. Shekinah, hear me today. What God has promised you more than 40 years ago and what you experienced and what you are supposed to experience today is only going to come when we as a people dwell together in unity. I shared this particular week during this time of five days of fasting uh, uh, and pray as I, we got up five o'clock in the morning as we prayed at 7.30 as I prayed during the day. One of the things I focused on during the entire week was the six things that God hates, the seventh thing that is an abomination to God. Go with me this morning in your Bibles. I'm speaking boldly today. I'm speaking boldly today that God wants us to meet this requirements, beloved. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 6. Listen to the word of the Lord this morning. This is a, a, a word that you and I need to very, listen very, very carefully. God is not going to give in to our carnal fancies, beloved. God is not going to succumb and be twisted by our religious ways. No, He wants to pour out His Spirit based on His requirements. Not our religious ways and our carnality. Proverbs chapter 6 Listen to this, 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 these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination. Listen to me, Shekinah. Listen to me, body of Christ. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil. But this I want to highlight today. A false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among brethren. The one who sows discord among brethren is abomination to God. 
where we allow people to gossip, speak lies and bring discord. That is the thing that will stop revival from coming. But the early church were together in one accord. Can you, according to Matthew chapter 18, if you have something against your brother and your brother or sister has offended you, go to him and say, my brother, you've offended me according to the scriptures. This is what you did is not a right thing. There's a biblical way of restitution. There's a biblical way of repentance. Let us not Beloved, come up against each other in a carnal way. There is a requirement that needs to happen. Jesus addressed Peter, re re restored him, and he repented and thought he was not worthy. But Jesus re restored Peter and the blood of Jesus that flowed on, on Calvary's hill was, uh, was, was shed for Peter. Restored Peter and said, Peter, go feed the sheep. If you love me, obey me. Beloved, a Pentecostal church is a church that loves God. A church of the fire is a church that loves God. And Peter is restored. And on the day of Pentecost, he preaches and 3,000 people get saved. Why? Because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because he and the other 11 were in one accord. They were concluded. The number uh, was concluded to 12. They chose the 12 apostles before the day of Pentecost. It displays fullness it displays completeness it plays displays the governance of god god functions on unity beloved god functions on unity isn't this interesting and the holy spirit brought this to my attention as i relay this message to you today listen to this the bible says tongues of fire fire like tongues were split between them and fell on each one of, uh, of them it's a, it's a unique display. We don't see it in any other way. It, it, well, yes, in, in, even in Maltari's day, they experienced a similar phenomenon. But beloved, listen to this. The Holy Spirit brought this to my attention. Even the Pentecostal church, Jesus said, any kingdom divided against himself uh, shall fall. Any church, any divided church, any divided people will, will fall. Discord, beloved. Let me share a warning today. Even on this Facebook public platform, Shekinah, if we are divided amongst each other and like this one and don't like this one, this, uh, this is displeased of that one and, and pleased of the other, that we are sectarian, that we are this group and that group. No, we need to come together in repentance before the Lord and repentance before one another. If you have uh, 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 offended somebody, else, you need to repent. Your pastor needs to repent. God is not going to pour out His Holy Spirit in the way that I desire. If just thinking just because I accepted Jesus at age 11 and got the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at age 11 and experienced revival in my 20s at UWC. No. God is no man's uh, 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 debtor, beloved. Hear me today, Shekinah. Only when we are in one accord will God pour out His Holy Spirit. We are a Pentecostal church that needs to have tongues of fire that speak for the word of God boldly. Like a Peter, they spoke boldly. Like the early church there, you can only speak boldly when you have the fire of the Holy Ghost upon your lips. Don't use your lips to, to spread fires of dissent. Don't, uh, James says, this tongue that's unbridled, can, like, a, like a fire, can spread and cause uh, uh, disaster. And cause havoc. Don't use your tongue to bring division. Use your tongue, beloved, to speak health, to speak unity, to speak one accord. And when we are in that place, like the early church, we will experience the Holy Spirit fire. I say to you this morning, ready yourself in obedience. Set yourself in the joy of God. Set yourself, ready yourself, set yourself um, in one accord, O church of God. But lastly... The Bible said, while they were seated, they were praying. They were in one accord praying, beloved. Prayer is the key to revival. If you ever want to know the power of revival, this is another book. Besides Maltari's book about like a mighty wind. I read this book as a student. Prayer, the key to revival. Shekinah prayer is the key to revival. If we're going to be recipients of the Holy Spirit fire. We've got to pray. Lastly. Let me share with you this morning. In closing my testimony. Of how I experienced. An outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When I was a young man. Not only at the age. Of 11. 
did I experience an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But it was in my 20s, as a first year student, student in 1987. I went to university to study a degree uh, in teaching. But I felt myself strangely drawn by the Holy Spirit. I did not know what it was. I just felt myself daily as I would hike from retreat to, to Belleville where our campus was. And I went to class and instead of sitting in, in the student center uh, playing club adjust and talking on the, uh, on the steps of the library, I found myself drawn to a room in the student center that was empty. The student center at that time was brand new. And I found myself praying in a way I've never prayed before. I found myself prostrate before the Lord, worshiping God with my face on the carpet, with my face into the carpet, seeking God, seeking the face of God for days, for months, three days a week. I would fast Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursdays. I shared with you uh, before, but I would feel in my heart prompted to share this with you as I relay this to you. Not only as 11 year old did I receive a, a, a relay outpouring of the Holy Spirit when our priest, uh, Reverend Peacock, filled with the Holy Spirit. His replacement, Reverend uh, 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 Patrick, who took me by the hand and uh, uh, took me from youth camp to youth camp where we experienced in Anglican churches the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But at age 29 years later, after having a longing from the Lord as a teenager for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is unprecedented. I met up with a few students that, that heard what I was doing. They were started praying with me. And how we experienced an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. To such a day that in the late 80s and early 90s, hundreds of students at the university got saved as we knocked on their doors in the hostel rooms as we met with them in the student center, as we had open airs, as we, as we spoke to people in, uh, in lecture rooms and in the library and, and in the admin room, wherever we found ourselves at the swimming pool, baptizing people, experiencing an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 700, 800 people in the main hall when the student, when the, when the lecture rooms became too small. We had to go to the biggest venue, which was the student center, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, we in our day can experience, I'm looking for a people that's willing to wait with me in obedience, willing to wait with me in joy during this lockdown to wait upon the Lord in obedience, in joy, in unity, that God would knit our hearts together. Let us not find ourselves in a place of disobedience. Let us not find us ourselves in a place of apathy, but let us find ourselves in a place of one accord. Beloved, I say to you today with a warning. I wanted to say it earlier, but I'm going to say it now. The Bible says that God hates the man and the woman who causes strife. I warn you today in the spirit. If you are of the nature to cause strife, you will find yourself in a place of experiencing the hatred of God. No matter who you are, no matter what stature you may have, no matter what importance you have, that if you are a man and a woman that will cause strife and discord, you will find yourself being an enemy of God. Shekinah, I don't want to be an enemy of God. I want to be a recipient of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We are such a generation that if we're willing to obey, willing to joyfully wait, willing to be in one accord, willing to pray. And just like this book of, of Paul Yonke Cho, he has the biggest church in the world. Hundreds and thousands of people because they are people of prayer. An entire mountain dedicated to pray. We may not have a mountain, but we have a bedroom. We may not have a mountain, but we have a lounge. We may not have a mountain, but I have got a garage where I can go to it during this lockdown and see God. And just like the early church was locked down, just like the early church was locked down in an upper room, while we are locked down, can we wait upon Him? In obedience, with joy, with one accord, and in prayer. And I guarantee you that God will not disappoint us. That what we expect as we ready ourselves as we steady ourselves as we set ourselves 
let us also wait. That word wait is, is waiting even in difficulty. We find ourselves in a difficult time right now, beloved. We find ourselves in unprecedented difficult times. Like a hundred years ago when there was the Spanish flu. Once again we face similar circumstances. Based on that this, this morning, beloved, I want to address you lastly on one thing. As a church leadership, the governing body, uh, through discussions uh, um, this week, agreed that uh, even though the president has, with his national uh, COVID command council, have decided to lift the regulations related to, to religious uh, institutions, that they can gather in groups of 50 um, uh, as of next week. Even though, in spite of that, beloved, we have decided as a governing body not to open our church building uh, to our worship service like we have come accustomed to it before COVID-19. There are many reasons why we uh, are, have decided to do so. But just to highlight one thing, on the, on I think it was the 18th of March, on the 16th of March, the leadership came together prior to the lockdown announcement that we believe that in, in, in the interest of the health and well-being of the saints, that we will close our services. It was a decision that we as a leadership did before the president made the lockdown. So we are deciding to uphold that decision and not open our buildings. Yes, it's been difficult. It's been difficult than most of us. It is, it's not the most pleasant thing to, to worship from a distance. But the interest of our health, many of our folk have been in self-isolation because they work at places where they've been exposed to the coronavirus. Some of them have loved ones who have uh, proven positive. Even one of our leaders called me today to say that uh, a, a, his daughter and son-in-law uh, contracted uh, the disease. Uh, and so, beloved, we do not know. So we do not want to open our building not to the technical things and uh, having to use these uh, machines to blow this uh, 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 disinfectant, whatever it's called, uh, to disinfect the church. Every time we have to do it, we've got to, uh, we've got to get agencies in to disinfect the place. So, beloved, it's not about that. It is your health and your well-being that we have decided um, not to, to open our building for... For services it is still open the church has never been closed that we have met in small groups and when that stopped um, we abided by the rules and I believe that we need to submit to, to to the authorities they're not telling us that we cannot preach the minute our president tells me that I cannot preach the gospel the minute he stops me or the government uh, takes away my right <clears throat> my religious right to exercise my faith, then I, I tell you today, publicly on this forum, if that is what our president is going to do in the future, God forbid that he would. I don't think he will. That I will be the first one to exercise civil disobedience against such a draconian law that stops me from preaching the gospel. That is not what the government is asking right now. They're asking us to, clo to, to be uh, uh, circumspect in our services, to all of these things, but we want to protect your health and your well-being at this time. The collective leadership of our church will meet this coming Tuesday uh, to discuss uh, how we can improve uh, our service and offering to you as a church, the governing body, the spiritual presbytery, and the department leaders, just the, the department leaders, the spiritual presbytery, uh, the, meaning our pastoral assistants, um, our area shepherds and our elders, together with our governing body, will come together we will put our heads together and think and creatively of how we can improve. We've learned many lessons. There are many times when I couldn't do a broadcast because I don't have the necessary equipment. Churches throughout the world are struggling. Uh, the very wealthy churches can have, uh, you know, very uh, expensive equipment with lights and cameras to, and, and bandwidth to, to do so. We don't have that facilities at our church. So we're going to come together and how best to... Uh, um, do it and potentially having uh, small groups again, uh, training small group leaders. But those decisions we will share with you. Potentially I'll share with that with you on Wednesday as we go live um, with our online service. What the new uh, uh, plans are. And in the, as the, 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 
the level uh, uh, three out pains and out works and going to level two and level one, we will always decide in your best interest how we should ex uh, execute our ministerial role to you, our pastoral care role and function to you, how I as your pastor need to live out my calling. And do, I pray that you would pray for me. I, I petition your prayers. It is not easy leading a church in such times. It is not easy to lead uh, your leadership from a distance, to lead from a telephone, to lead via Zoom. It's, 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 it is not a common way, but we need to live within that scenario and do our best. I pray that you would pray for me, pray for our governing body, pray for our presbytery, pray for our department leaders that this coming Tuesday, that we will make further best decisions in your interest. But know this, that I'm praying for you. Aurelia and I are really in prayer for you. My wife, Pray for the women in praying, in prayer for our children. Our leadership as a collective is praying for you. So, beloved, uh, let me speak God's blessing over you today as we conclude today's message. I say to you today, um, continue to be faithful in your stewardship. Thank you for showing yourself faithful. As I said, the church didn't close. Uh, we have nine feeding stations. We are continually handing out our food parcels. We are being the hands and feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are living the gospel at this time, living compassion, living the love of God, living the Great Commission in practical ways outside of the four walls of the building. Shekinah is alive. Shekinah is in ministry. Shekinah is living out the love of God in practical ways. So I encourage you to continue to give as we take this message of the gospel, of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, even to, I'm praying that as people experience a hot meal, that that will be an expression of Pentecost, an expression of the Pentecostal experience. It was not just about Peter preaching, it was about them looking after their needs according to uh, Acts chapter 2, 42 and onwards. So beloved, continue to be faithful in your giving online and your online banking and for those who, now that the church is uh, open, we'll share more on Wednesday about the, the office being open to some degree. We also still want to protect the health of our staff and to be aware of that. So Shekinah, God bless you. Thank you for all of you that have been online with me today. I hope that, me, that that word touched you. I pray that you will continue to desire an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So let me speak the blessing of the Lord over you today. As I share with you, the Lord bless you, Shekinah and family and friends. And the Lord keep you. The Lord makes his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace. God bless you. Go in the peace of the Lord and trust God in this day for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life. God bless you.